Sid Barrett, founder of the psychedelic rock band Pink Floyd, has long fascinated music fans for years. Although many consider him a genius, his musical legacy leaves some people uneasy. Barrett's sudden disappearance from the music scene in the early 1970s left us with many questions. Was his talent destroyed by taking too much LSD? Or was he just turned off by the commercial pressures of pop stardom? Was his strange music a product of his mental decline? Or were his songs just a bizarre expression of his unique outlook on life? This is British Music History, and in this video, we'll be looking at how the songs of Sid Barrett are no laughing matter. And what exactly is a joke? Like many 60s rockers, Sid Barrett's journey into pop music started when he left his Cambridge home and enrolled at art school. A keen painter, Sid's early paintings hint at what he would later explore in his music, with one painting ominously depicting a mother trying to protect her children from lions. After forming a band with fellow musicians Nick Mason, Roger Waters and Richard Wright, Sid was credited with coming up with the name Pink Floyd by combining the names of blues singers Pink Anderson and Floyd Council. However, beyond giving them their name, Sid's musical influence was keenly felt from the offset. As their frontman, Sid's pioneering use of the Binson Echo Rec found favour in the nascent underground music scene in Britain. Pink Floyd played lengthy jamming sessions and elaborate light shows at the UFO Club, such as in the groundbreaking and exploratory Interstellar Overdrive. <laughs> Sid was an innovator and a true original. Though he lacked the virtuosity of other guitarists, he helped forge a new sound unlike anything anyone had ever heard before. A whirling cacophony of mesmerising noise, which went down a storm with London's counterculture movement. It wasn't long before the mainstream caught on. Sid's breakthrough single with Pink Floyd was Arnold Lane in March 1967, a strange slice of English psychedelic pop about a man stealing women's clothes from washing lines. Collecting clothes, moonshine, washing line. They suit him the song peaked at number 20 in the UK singles chart, but at the time it was seen as a big departure from the more abstract adventures in sound they toyed with at the UFO Club. It was here that Sid Barrett's lyrical genius began to blossom. Sid drew upon children's literature and fairy tales for inspiration, as if he was trying to hark back to a childhood where his mother would read bedtime stories to shield him from the horrors of the world. Sid sought refuge in Edward Lear's nonsense poetry, Lewis Carroll's Tales of Alice in Wonderland, Hilaire Belloc's Cautionary Tales for Children, and of course, Kenneth Graham's The Wind in the Willows. Pink Floyd's follow-up single in June 1967, See Emily Play, was an even bigger hit for the band, reaching number six in the UK charts. This led to Pink Floyd performing on Top of the Pops for the very first time. Like a gallop through the Gog Magog hills of his youth, See Emily Play was a feverish, otherworldly shanty for acid trippers, a journey down a rabbit hole of Sid's own making. Sid's music was obviously very LSD inspired, with bizarre sound effects used on See Emily Play zipping their way through a whirlwind of hallucinogenic soundscapes. Barrett's role as Pink Floyd's creative visionary was cemented on their debut LP, The Piper at the Gates of Dawn, which took its name from a chapter in The Wind in the Willows. Released in August 1967, the album kicked off with Astronomy Domine, a fairly uncharacteristic foray into space rock. Not only is it packed with literary references to William Shakespeare and Percy Bysshe Shelley's poem Prometheus Unbound, but it is also inspired by science fiction comics, which inspired Sid as a youth. Taken as a whole, The Piper at the Gates of Dawn is a lyrical tour de force, 
celebrating Sid Barrett's regression into a world of childlike imagination. Lucifer Sam recalls Dick Whittington. It's a song of heightened paranoia which might allude to a bad trip. That cat's something I can't explain. The song Matilda Mother once again begins with nursery rhymes as its foundation. There was a king who ruled the land. His majesty was in command. Time and time again, the stories told to Sid as a young boy bubble to the surface, such as in Flaming. Sitting on a unicorn. And as if from the pages of Dennis Watkin Pitchford's Little Grey Men, Sid's song The Gnome even tells the fantastical story of A gnome named Grimble Grumble And little gnomes stay in their homes Drawn to a search for spiritual meaning, Sid even set the I Ching to music on the song Chapter 24. For movement is accomplished in six stages. The rural ideal of Sid's upbringing too is evoked in The Scarecrow. Like the best children's literature, there is a hint of darkness lurking in this song. The tale of a scarecrow being brought to life, but doomed to be tethered to a stick in the middle of the English countryside. The black and green scarecrow was sadder than me, but now he's resigned to his fate, his life's not unkind, he doesn't mind. And lastly, Bike is a jolly homage to those carefree days of Sid riding bicycles in Cambridge as a kid. Only in this song, he's accompanied by an old mouse named Gerald and a clan of gingerbread men. You're the kind of girl that fits in with my world. I'll give you anything, everything if you want me. Sadly, Sid Barrett was unable to sustain this creative momentum for long. Did he simply grow uncomfortable with the levels of fame and attention Pink Floyd had acquired? At this time, Sid's behaviour seemingly grew more erratic. Was this the moment Sid's appetite for taking LSD evolved from providing him with creative inspiration to throwing his mind into complete disarray? No one can ever really know for sure. What is known is that Sid's last single with the band Apples and Oranges was an undeniable flop. Shortly thereafter, the other members of Pink Floyd grew concerned about Sid's mental well-being, recognising his unreliability and lack of focus. Sid's songwriting contributions to Pink Floyd's second album, A Saucer Full of Secrets, started to dwindle drastically. By the end of 1967, perhaps aware that he was slowly but surely being nudged out of the picture, Sid Barrett recorded his last video with Pink Floyd, a performance of Jug Band Blues, the only song he wrote for the band's second album. It's awfully considerate of you to think of me here And I'm most obliged to you for making it clear that I'm not here As a window into Sid's fragile psyche, Jug Band Blues is a fascinating expression of a songwriting talent on the brink of collapse, a poetic musing of being aware of one's own mental fragility. Some have speculated that perhaps Sid was suffering from schizophrenia, a delicate flower forever threatened by a wind which could blow him away at any moment. I don't care if the sun does shine, and I don't care if nothing is mine. Having been quietly dismissed by the band in January 1968, Sid Barrett's future as a songwriter looked extremely uncertain. His former band, Pink Floyd, had now gone on without him. Sid seemed listless and unsure of his place in the music business, making several half-hearted attempts to record demos without much success. Towards the end of the 1960s, however, Sid Barrett had somehow mustered enough songs to record a new album. Heading to Abbey Road with the production help of David Gilmour, the same man who had replaced him in Pink Floyd, Sid was cajoled into recording his debut solo LP, the Madcap Laughs, which was eventually released in January 1970. Gone was the airy-fairy psychedelia and production magic of Piper, 
to be replaced instead with a more homespun, ramshackle brand of lo-fi folksiness. Among the occasionally shambolic noise, there are many flashes of Sid's lyrical genius which can be heard throughout this album. The album's lead single, Octopus, is perhaps Sid at his most lyrically ambitious. Taking its starting point from an octopus ride at an amusement park, the song is a helter-skelter of surrealism, with lyrical nods to everything from Mother Goose to John Clare's poem, Fairy Things. The rhythm on Octopus is delightfully lopsided, twisting and turning throughout, always showcasing Sid's knack for clever wordplay. However, critical response to the madcap laughs was mixed. Today, there are those who regard it as a minor masterpiece and the work of one of Britain's true eccentric visionaries. Highlights on the album include the wonky music hall of Love You and Here I Go, with each song showing the debt Sid Barrett owed to a peculiarly British sensibility. She don't rock and roll. She don't like it. She don't... Golden Hair sees Sid set a piece of lyrical poetry by James Joyce to music. Lean out your window, golden hair. It contains all the unrequited love of Romeo pining for Juliet outside her window, or a handsome prince hoping Rapunzel throws down her hair. And in Dark Globe, we see an almost prophetic vision of Sid's self-imposed exile in later life wondering if things would be really any different if he was gone for good. Won't you miss me? Wouldn't you miss me at all? Any hope to establish Sid Barrett as a commercially viable folk singer-songwriter seemed futile, but nonetheless, Sid was invited back into the studio to record his second solo LP, Barrett. Again produced by Dave Gilmore, this was a more polished production effort, more focused and considered than the Madcap Laughs. Released in the November of 1970, Barrett contained the likes of Baby Lemonade, a carnivalesque dose of longing like a lost soul at the circus. In the sad town, cold iron hands clap the party of clowns outside. Then there's the eerie dominoes, a hauntingly plodding reflection where Sid draws an analogy between playing dominoes on a rainy day with the idea of how people can be toppled by circumstance. You and I, you and I and dominoes. Elsewhere, the sublime organ playing on Gigolo Aunt, an upbeat and chuntering electric rocker, is probably the only song on the album that had the potential to be a single. And in a final highlight recalling Sid's earlier 60s output, Effervescing Elephant is a funny belloc pastiche with an odd brass arrangement which shows Sid's darkly comic sense of humour. The year of one inferior that by next June he'd die, oh yeah, because the tiger would roam. After gifting the world with his solo efforts, things took a tragic turn for Sid. He withdrew from music again before he gave a final interview in 1971 with Rolling Stone magazine, telling them, I'm disappearing, avoiding most things. I'm treading the backward path. That path led him back to his mother's home in Cambridge, and that is where Sid stayed for the rest of his life. He never made music again. What British music lost that day was a talent truly without peer. Sid's absence loomed large over the career of his former band Pink Floyd. Roger Waters continued to reference their lost frontman on iconic albums Dark Side of the Moon and Wish You Were Here, with the latter album famously describing Sid as a crazy diamond with eyes like black holes in the sky. Of course, we can speculate endlessly about whether it was the drugs that led to Sid Barrett's downfall, but really, it's the music that matters most. Acid casualty or not, the songs Sid left behind are a time capsule of mind-mangling originality, and British music history owes much to his unique contributions. Sid Barrett might have shone brightly and briefly, but we can only hope the Crazy Diamond's musical legacy will shine on forever. I hope you've enjoyed this video everyone. If you'd like to see more video essays like this on British music history, please make sure you click the like and subscribe button for more content. Thanks for watching.